Um, so before starting properly, I'd just like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that most of us are, all of us are um, on at the moment. For me, that's Ngunnawal and Ngumbri land. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners, um, past, present and future. Um, so today's Synapse talk is Professor Alan Rumsey, a linguistic anthropologist who works with Indigenous communities in Australia and has for many years worked with the Kuwaru community in the central highlands of Papua New Guinea, um, particularly looking at um, child language acquisition and socialisation. Um, and this is what Alan is going to talk about um, today, this part of his research with a focus on um, the development of intersubjectivity. So thank you very much, Alan. Thank you very much, uh, Beth, and thanks for uh, inviting me to give this talk you, to you and Chris, the organizers of the series. Um, so uh, as um, Beth suggests, what I'm going to do is give you a kind of snapshot of the work that Francesca Merlin and I have been doing for many years in the New Guinea Highlands uh, on this topic of children's language socialization. We've been wor working there on and off, you know, for better part of the last four decades on various topics. Uh, we I just started in a small way on the study of children's uh, language acquisition in 1997. And uh, then that that was sort of a side project that got going as a, as a main one in, in 2013 with dedicated ARC funding. And uh, since then, uh, a, a number of people have been involved in the work. Francesca, obviously, uh, uh, Lor recently Lauren Reed, Stephanie Yam, who are my uh, uh, current uh, research assistant, but many other ANU research assistants along the way and field assistants within uh, the Kuru region who I'll be um, showing you on screen in a while. Um, so our work on this project is aimed partly at questions that arise from linguistics and from linguistic anthropology, but also at ones which uh, I think are of central importance for sociocultural anthropology and for the human sciences more generally. Uh, and with that, I'll see if I can share my screen and put them up on the board. Okay, here are the questions. The first one, how to understand the, the way people come to think, feel, and act as human beings embedded within particular communities and ways of life. So these are questions of very general interest for the human sciences. And second, how do more or less shared ways of life at various levels and time scales get reproduced and transformed in everyday human interaction. Uh, the work is uh, in, based in the Kuwaru region, as I've said, which is right uh, right here inside the Big Donut. Uh, it's uh, this sort of central uh, valley floor of the New Guinea highlands up at about 2,000 meters. So it has a year round growing season, very fertile soil. And as many of you know, this is a place where agriculture has been practiced almost as long as any other place in the world, probably about 10,000 years. And you can see it, still people see that people are still very good at it and do it very intensively, having uh, cleared this whole sweet potato garden with, uh, by hand with those shovels, those, these and many other people. Um, so here is the, uh, here's the area from a Google, uh, Google Earth uh, photo. An uh, important fact about it is it's, relatively close to the town of Mount Hagen here, which is the provincial capital and the third biggest town in New Guinea, about 50,000 people. Um, but you can see it's, it's about 15 k's away through a, 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 okay, the Highlands Highway goes down here, but it's then about a two hour walk from there up to Kailge. Uh, there is a, a road that goes all the way nowadays, but it's, uh, it's the end of the road. This is the Tambo Range, so it's you get you get the sense of being in a fairly uh, stable community without a lot of people coming and going through it who who don't actually come from there. Um, and here is it, it. There are no villages in this area of the Highlands. Uh, people live scattered among their gardens. You'll see some examples later on. But there are uh, what could be called settlements, government established settlements. And this is Kalge, near where we live, is one. This is, it's got the biggest school in the area. Uh, about, it goes up to grade eight, you know, several, like five, five or 600 students. So here we're looking across the Neblier Valley 
uh, Mount Hagen would be up here somewhere. Uh, and so this is, I said, the, the work has been going on, uh, on on language with kids for many years. This was taken in 2014, uh, sorry, 2004, a long time ago. And I'll just show you a few of the pictures. Uh, here we're getting, flashing forward to the time when we, we were doing the full-on project uh, funded by ARC with, among other things, with kids wearing GoPro cameras. So this is a, a conversation. We get uh, like kids in groups of maybe three, four, five with two of whom are wearing GoPro. So most of the stuff generally appears on screen. And here's uh, Francesca uh, talking with one of her friends there about something, uh, you know, very, uh, very important, I'm sure. Um, so back to the, uh, the questions that I said are, are central to this, act, this uh, project. Um, the, the question, given that our, the focus that, that we have is uh, on language, the question is why that focus in relation to these questions? So in order to sort of clear the ground for that question, I'm going to, uh, for answering that question, I'm going to respond to the skeptical position taken by Pierre Bourdieu, uh, anthropologist, sociologist, and very uh, you know, important social theorist. Um, and I do that because I believe that his work is it remains one of the most important touchstones with respect to these two questions that you see on the board. And I also do it because in addressing those questions, would you place great importance on early childhood experience and on embodiment as a crucial aspect of social life and um, the reproduction of ways of life, as nearly everyone does nowadays, reproduction and transformation, I should say. But okay, I think this is very common common stance that's taken in, in anthropology, at least in a lot of the social sciences, a focus on uh, embodied experience. Um, but I disagree with some of the ways in which Bourdieu and many others have characterized the role of language and speech and the way they have developed um, their critiques of what they have seen to be an overemphasis on language and speech in various kinds of social theory, uh, as if it were, uh, um, somehow antithetical to a focus on embodiment. Among the other theorists identified, uh, among those other theorists that are similar to Bourdieu in this respect are um, ones identified with a so-called affective turn in social theory and cultural studies, such as Brian Masumi and Nigel Thrift. So just the, in the way that Bourdieu criticized uh, what they, he saw as an overemphasis on language in previous social theory, so uh, affect theorists write against what they see as an overemphasis on language in theories of subjectivity and emotion and the relation of subjectivity and emotion to the social. So Brian Masumi, for example, distinguishes between affect and emotion and uh, considers affect to be a realm which defies what he calls sociolinguistic fixing through classification, narrative, etc. And Affect, in his view, operates on and through the body directly as a, a kind of unqualified intensity, uh, pure intensity. An idea that comes from Gilles Deleuze and ultimately from Barak Spinoza and from, well, in particular from Deleuze's reading of, of Spinoza's ethics, which is not the only possible one. Anyway, um, but it's had enormous effect, enormous influence on a, lot, a wide range of social theory and cultural studies. Similarly, uh, Nigel Thrift, uh, along with many others, calls for new ways of understanding affect that do not make use of ideas of representation or signification. So the main problem I find with these versions of affect theory, and also with the parallel kind of downplaying by Bourdieu that I summarized above, uh, downplaying of, of speech and language, is that in keeping with a certain Western common sense view of the matter, these critiques have tended to equate language in general with only one of its functions, namely the communication of discursively explicit propositions about the world by one speaker to another. And this view is famously uh, represented in a diagram by Ferdinand de Saussure in his uh, foundational text on, uh, on linguistics. He was a kind of founding figure in structural linguistics. This shot will be, uh, this diagram I think will be familiar to people who've studied uh, first year linguistics. Um, so you see that his idea, what, hap what language is for is the conveying of ideas. So an idea arises in the mind of this guy, 
uh, and then gets turned into sound, which goes and reaches this guy's ear, and then uh, this guy does the same in return. So it's about the transmission of ideas. Um, so um, one of the one of the one of Bo the aims of Bourdieu's notion of habitus was, of course. Uh, to show, contrary to this uh, idea, uh, this uh, understanding of the function of language, that um, that uh, ways of life, sociocultural formations, are reproduced without discursively explicit formulations of them. So it's not about the, anything discursively explicit. This kind, this work of reproduction is done through what he calls an implicit pedagogy, capable of instilling a whole cosmology an ethic, a metaphysic, a political philosophy through injunctions as significant as stand up straight or don't hold your knife in your left hand. And the uh, important background to this is that Bourdieu did his fieldwork in Northern Africa in the uh, Islamic uh, community in Algeria, uh, Kabul. Um, don't hold your knife in your left hand. So it's important to note here though that although uh, Bourdieu characterizes the process as an implicit one and downplays the role of speech. Nonetheless, it's not really a pedagogy that goes without speaking. At least it doesn't go without saying anything. The point is, I mean, these are crucial uh, parts of it. The utterances, don't hold your knife in your left hand, etc. The point is rather that these utterances do not convey explicit propositions about cosmology, ethics, metaphysics, or political philosophy. Indeed, uh, contrary to the talking heads model of language function that I uh, just discussed, they do not convey propositions at all. Rather, as Bourdieu says, they are injunctions. They do not describe a state of affairs in the world, but rather enjoin the person they are addressed to to, to do something, or in one of his examples, not to do something. Don't hold your knife in your left hand. Interestingly, in this respect, uh, imperatives occupy a plane of language which is especially in, in which it is especially clear that there's a huge overlap between linguistic and non-linguistic aspects of human interaction. So to illustrate that I'm going to show you this uh, uh, short video of a little girl of about one year of age made in 2013 looking out the front door of Francesca's in my house at Calle. And at the beginning of the video, we see her sitting on the ground playing with a small uh, sprouting banana plant. She was teething at the time, so she was probably in search of suitable objects to chew on, and this was a very good one. So watch what happens next. Mm, good. I'm going to turn the sound off because it's not really, it's background noise. What's important is what she sees and uh, off to her right, as you will notice shortly. Mm, boy. Uh-oh. Notice the scowl on her face. Mm -mm. Come along with me. <laughs> okay. Um, so you can see in this case, there was no verbal component to the interaction between this little girl and her mother, but the mother Mawa's action towards her clearly had the same kind of force as the hypothetical utterances uh, cited by Bourdieu. Stand up straight, don't hold your knife in your left hand. And indeed, in actual instances of those utterances by the people that Bourdieu was talking about, the Kabil or anyone else with such utterances, they would always be accompanied by a nonverbal component, including at least the intonation and voice quality with which they were spoken, and often uh, physical intervention, such as straightening the child's posture or removing the knife from his left hand and placing it in his right. Um, so given that, uh, that these injunctions can take place, uh, the equivalent of them can take place entirely wordlessly, um, an example, uh, a question arises, what difference does language make? In order to, uh, to look at that question, I'm going to uh, introduce a, an interaction involving a slightly ch older child, Josephine. Uh, her mother 
Okay, here's Josephine, her mother, baby, and little uh, Jerry, who's her uh, older brother, uh, five or six years old. Um, this was taken in 1997 with um, mini uh, mini DV um, ta you know ca cassette, so it's it's pre. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a great, a very clear film, but uh, clear enough to get the point. And I, uh, so as it starts out, um, Josephine has, okay, J Jerry is playing with this uh, PVC pipe that, on which he's using, which he's using to blow on the fire. You can see these are hearthstones and there's a fire just down here. And uh, Josephine reaches out for it. Uh, she wants to try it. So here, as the video is about to start, Josephine's gotten it from her brother, Jerry now. And uh, you can see that uh, there's lots of things going on, including some use of speech by the mother and brother. Whoa, like this. Put it up to your mouth like this. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you can see that, okay, in this actual uh, example of interaction, language and speech are thoroughly intertwined uh, with nonverbal aspects. So that, for example, the the verbal instruction to blow to Josephine to blow the fire, which she probably can't understand at all, uh, as speech, is nonetheless massively uh, reinforced by the, Jerry's demonstrations of of that act, uh, showing her how to do it and. Uh, so in, the speak, in, in keeping with the spirit of Bourdieu's claim, I have argued elsewhere that such directive acts uh, in, in, in language, the use of imperative verbs, among other things, plays a bigger role in instilling uh, ethical stances and value orientations than do discursively explicit pronouncements about such matters. Just as Bourdieu would claim, it's not a question of language versus non-language, but uses of language. So given that such uh, direct uh, directive acts can be largely or entirely nonverbal, uh, as in these two cases. Uh, as I said, the question arises: What difference does language make? I think it probably doesn't make much difference in this interaction because I don't think Josephine can understand yet. Uh, but in order to give you uh, a feel for how that works with kids of a somewhat older age, I'm going to I'm about to turn to an interaction involving a girl a little girl of 21 months with her father. Um, and I'm gonna show in, in, in th via that interaction that uh, four different things are going on in it at once. The, the little girl is learning a language, developing her capacity for intersubjectivity. Uh, the shape she's having, uh, she's becoming a particular kind of person with particular kinds of feelings and uh, ways of being. And the, uh, fourth, fourthly, the reproduction and transformation of sociocultural formations or, or ways of life. Um, this interaction took place uh, on this kind of uh, gathering, at this gathering place in Kailige. This is an important place because, it, as I said, there, there were not villages there, but this is a kind of uh, meeting place where people come to uh, hold this, you know, discussions. You can see that there's some kind of talk going on here. Um, and uh, they, they have, uh, they put on ceremonial exchange events and stuff, but uh, for present purposes, the most important thing about it, this is the, the terminus for the only uh, motor vehicle that runs back and forth between Mount Hagen and this place, Kailige. Um And it runs along this, uh, this road, which was built in the colonial days by, uh, you know, by human uh, labor just by, by manual labor with shovels. Um, so it's a bit of a rough ride, but it does get you there and you can get to Mount Hagen and back in the day, uh, in those days on mainly on these back, backs of these trucks, PMV or Potter, public motor vehicle. So this conversation took place between, as I said, a father and her little girl um, who were sitting somewhere around here. Uh, I don't have video at the time, it was just uh, audio recording. Um, and here's the here's a transcript of uh, a small part of it. Um, so, as the the father and the daughter were sitting there on this public square, they uh, you know fully aware that everyone knows this is the place where you you catch a, a car to town. Uh, the father uh, points to a 
uh, an older boy, maybe four or five years old, who's walking across the, the display ground near them and uh, says this to his daughter, Mawa Wito, call out to Mawa, instructing her to call out to Mawa. And so the daughter does, Mawai. And then the words that are spoken by the father here are not addressed to Mawa. They're addressed to the daughter, um, Laplin, to, for, for her to shout out to uh, Mawa. And so, let's, so when he says, let's you and I go in a car, he's, he's putting words in the little girl's mouth and uh, per, saying that she should ring, sing out and propose to, to uh, Mawa that they go together. And the, the daughter partially responds with uh, an appropriate remark, yes, come. So um, I'm gonna, as I said, I'm gonna show you how all of these processes uh, take, uh, are, are happening in just about any kind of interaction that involves speech. Um, and I'll show you that with this, uh, this example in particular. Now, can you see, I've got the, the zoom bar above the top part of this screen. Now, can you see the, the, the heading at the top? Yep, we can, Alan. Okay, that's fine. Um, so, uh, in, in, in the first place, it, it, it is part of a developmental process through which the little girl, uh, Laplin, is learning to speak the, the Kuwati language. What she says here shows that she's still at the one word stage of language acquisition that's common to um, toddlers of her age around the world. And in each of her turns, she does what she's supposed to do and repeats the words which her father has, uh, has instructed her to, to say. Mawa wito, uh, mawai. Uh, but what she does, uh, what, what, she do, what she says in doing that is by no means just purely imitative. It is responsive. So the second line shows that she understands this two word expression, wito, which means call out to, and appropriately uh, puts this ending on the name uh, of, of mawa. Mawai, mawai, it's like a evocative ending for calling out to people. Um, and uh, the fourth line shows that she can, at a basic level, understand an utterance which is far too complicated for her to process in, in its entirety. Uh, first of all, she understands that, she's, that this is an utterance that she's supposed to direct to, to Mawa, right? Uh, and second, uh, despite the complexity of this utterance, she pulls out the one word that she can process and which is actually the core of the of the proposition, of course, the, the imperative that she's being able, the injunction that she's being asked to, to sing out to Mawa, namely, come, come, you come here and let's you and I go together. Uh, so in fact, imperative verbs are one of the first that kinds that kids learn to process in this language as, as probably everywhere. Uh, okay, that's the first uh, aspect. Second, it, it belongs to an, a developmental process whereby Laplin is learning to share and exchange intentions and perspectives with others. In other words, she's developing her capacity for intersubjectivity. Exciting work in developmental psychology over the past several decades has shown that this capacity begins to develop very early in infants, consistent with earlier findings by uh, George Herbert Mead and Le Lev Vygotsky but based on much more sophisticated new forms of empirical evidence, it has been shown how the sense of self develops in tandem with the sense of self with other. Um, for typically developing infants, this begins with, within the first few days of birth in moments of what is known as primary intersubjectivity. When the infant draws on its innate mimetic faculty, ability to imitate, to engage in rounds of facial imitation with its caregivers and other kinds of mutual attunement in, involving the other senses. Later on, usually by about nine months, this develops into moments of triadic, three-sided engagement, or what is known as joint attention, drawing on our uniquely human capacity to focus jointly with others on objects of our attention and share and exchange perspectives in such a way as to coordinate our actions toward those objects. 
and you could see that happening in both of the videos that I showed you, the, the brief videos. And the second one, it happened in a complex way because the boy, Jerry, was involved in a triadic interaction with his mother, with uh, the object of which was uh, the, the, the child, uh, Josephine, and her, and her carryings on. And then the second one was between Jerry and the child and the, the blowpipe as an object. So this capacity to engage in triadic uh, interaction or joint attention begins to develop in children long before the onset of language acquisition and is a major enabling condition for it. It's also uh, almost uniquely, I mean, yes, uniquely highly developed in the human species and a kind of uh, one of the most distinctive aspects of our, our species. But language acquisition uh, although preceded by joint engagement, uh, uh, joint attention, in turn enables the development of much more elaborate forms of intersubjectivity. One of these is entailed in the use of imperative verbs like this one, to and wa. Um, as Laughlin learns to use and understand verbs such as wa and to, she's not only learning the Kuwaru language, she's sharpening her operational understanding of what it is to be a person with intentions of one's own uh, and of how language enables people to enjoin actions on others which are in line with the speaker's own intentions even if not with their addressees. In other words, an understanding that you may not want, uh, want what I want and I have a way of trying to get you to do it. Um, another way in which the development of inner subjectivity is put on a new footing with children's entry into language is through the use of represented or projected speech of the kind that you see exemplified here, where the father is not uh, is uh, not speaking directly to, uh, not only speaking directly to his daughter Lachlan here, but is putting words in her mouth to speak to somebody else. The prime, you know, the the the, the most common example of this is quotation. When you quote somebody else, uh, you're attributing a, a different speaker th those words to a different speaker. Here, the father's attributing them to a projected future speech situation involving his daughter as a speaker. So this, this uh, kind of projected speech is exemplified in every line of this exchange. Um, and I'll show you the, the, what's involved here um, in, in terms of this diagram. So the father, Taka, is speaking to his daughter in, a, in normal non-projected forms of speech the father and daughter will be uh, will be referring to things, you know, maybe uh, outside the speech situation, things that they're referring to. But here, the, there's a, a second level of triadic uh, relations in that the the father, in speaking to his daughter, is proposing a, a, another speech situation in which the daughter Laplin will be the speaker and address Mawa as he's going by, and will say that particular projected utterance. Um, so. In, in these cases, the represented speech, the stuff down here, is not, is, uh, not, it's not a representation of an utterance that's already been made, as in quotation, but rather it's functioning in a, uh, in, in a more prospective manner. What, what uh, Michael Halliday, I think, has the best term for this, he calls it projected speech. Even at the age of 21 months, Laplin seems to understand what she's being enjoined to do. I told you she clearly obeys the instructions, the prompts, and shouts out to Mawa. This is testament to the frequency with which Kuoru speaking adults and older children use this kind of prompting routine when speaking to younger children, as is also shown to be the case by Bambi Schieflin's pioneering study of child language socialization elsewhere in New Guinea among the Kaluli people. It is a, this kind of uh, projected speech is a powerful form of, of subjectification or uh, inculcating ways of feeling and being into, uh, into subjects, into other people, especially when the action is being, that is being enjoined is speech to another in that it presents to the child not only a model of interaction in which her uh, subjectivity is virtually aligned with that of the person speaking to them, but it also presents the, the addressed person with a model of what to expect 
in engagements with others. For example, in the ventriloquized words of the third line, uh, the father Taka is presenting to Laplan a model of what in order to get Mao's attention, she can as assume will be an alluring prospect for him, namely a trip to uh, Mount Hagen in the, at that time, the community's only motor vehicle. In other words, through a directive that Laplan is enjoined to issue to another, to Mawa, Laplan is herself being placed within an established landscape of differently valued places and kinds of movement within it and kinds of and ways of feeling about it. Um, and that takes me to, okay, so the third uh, kind of process is one in which uh, the, uh, the child is being, uh, is, is, is uh, being, uh, let me just move this. Yeah, is being, uh, becoming a particular person. Uh, in, in part, this is a matter of becoming a particular kind of person. For example, the way in which Laplan is prompted to call out to Mawa is consistent with an aggressive, in your face interactional style that is a pervasive feature of everyday life among Kuoro people as every, everywhere in the New, New Guinea Highlands, which Francesca and I have uh, found is that uh, makes it very, uh, a very different experience for us to go into to coastal communities where the much more laid back lifestyle comes as, uh, I would say, a welcome relief. Um, so uh, as, yeah, so this is, this is also evident in the second video that I showed you, where uh, Jerry is being very interventionist towards his little daughter. And what Laplan is pr uh, prompted to do here is to urge upon the passing boy, Mawa, a joint activity between the two of them. What she's, what she's being prompted to do is in this way is consistent with a strong local emphasis on high-spirited camaraderie, especially among members of the same clan as Laplin and Mawa are. And this is relatively gender neutral at this point, uh, as evident from this interaction, at this point of the, the child's development. Uh, given Laplin's young age, it's to be understood that Taka does not really intend for her and Mawa to go on, go off on their, uh, on their own on the truck. Rather, what is being enjoined upon Laplin is a playful proposal to Mawa as if that were Laplin's intention. But it is serious play on the father Taka's part in that he is modeling for Laplin a way of acting that is appropriate for the kind of person that Laplin is expected to become. Okay, the fourth aspect of this interaction it, is that it is part of a process whereby a more inclusive social order is being reproduced and transformed. It's uh, the embedding of the interaction within such an order will already be evident from what I have said about the way in which the interaction positions Laplin within an established landscape of differentially valued places and kinds of movements within it. A central place within this landscape is the provincial capital of Mount Hagen, which is a key node in Kuoru people's engagement with the cash economy and other aspects of the outside world. Their local economy is still largely a subsistence one based on cultivation of a wide variety of crops and raising of pigs, but there's now, and nowadays chickens also, but there's now also an intensive engagement with the cash economy based largely on their growing of coffee for the world market and vegetables for sale in, um, in Mount Hagen and further afield uh, as far away as Port Moresby. So um, in short, uh, when Laplan is, let me just go back to this, this, when Laplan is directed to propose a trip in the truck, it is to be taken for granted that this Mount Hagen will be its destination and that it will be understood to be an alluring destination. Uh, this is consistent with a pervasive distinction drawn by Kuoru people between Bo'uk, indigenous ways, and Kewa'uk, exogenous foreign ways, and a strong drive to engage with the latter. Other aspects of Kuoru people's everyday interactions, including ones involving young children are grounded in and contribute to 
the reproduction and transformation of a local landscape of more traditional so-called Mbo socio-territorial groupings, tribes, clans, etc., which continue to play a large part in people's social lives there, including marriage, wealth exchange, land tenure, agricultural production, and warfare. So in brief, I've shown that this interaction invo involves these four different kinds of process. Now, in order to provide a fuller example of how our project relates, uh, especially to these latter two processes, I'll turn to another interaction involving a somewhat older child, Jesse Pawa Onka, who was just over two years at the time. And here's Jesse at around that time playing with some, some other kids uh, from the area. Um, another speaker in the interaction is Jesse's mother, Wapi, who is the uh, wife of one of our main field assistants, John Onka. Um, so here, here, and John is one of two field assistants who've done the overwhelming uh, majority of the transcription, first draft transcription of the 200 and some hours of, of uh, recorded interaction that they've made over the last uh, seven years. Uh, so here's the tr here's a transcription of the interaction that uh, I'm, I'm going to be discussing, and you'll see uh, the English translation is in the the sort of free translation is in the right column here. The uh, the mother's uh, words are in plain type, and the son's are in uh, in italics. And also present at this interaction, sitting around uh, with them, but not participating in this part of it is. Uh, Jesse's older brother, Alex, who gets referred to here. Um, the interaction took place in their house in 2004 at around the same time those photos were taken. So I don't have time to go into anything like a full analysis uh, of this example and its relevance for these questions that I'm addressing. I can refer you to a fuller analysis if you like, but for present purposes, I, I just want to note two things about it. The first is that it makes, uh, again, makes lots of use of this uh, technique of prompting the kids, right? So um, the mother starts out by saying, uh, tell your brother, say to your brother, don't cry. And the son repeats that. Uh, mother says, let's you and I go to Kalye. Notice she no longer is framing that utterance by saying, say this. The kid is just to understand that these words spoken by uh, by the mother are to be repeated by the by the kid, which he does the best he can. Um, and so, it it makes, in fact, every line of this uh, excerpt is is uh, involves this kind of projected speech, this kind of prompting. But I want I'm going to play the audio, which is pretty bad because it was made in our pre digital days by these field assistants on cassette recorders. But um, I, I just want you to, uh, to listen to the recording and, and listen to the voice quality of the mother. She's, she whispers the words to the son and the son then shouts them out loudly to his older brother. So in other words, it, it's really, it really is a lot like the kind of prompting you get from a hole in the, in the floor of a stage. Um, let's, let's just listen to this. I'll follow it down with a cursor. See how she, you get this kind of whispered prompt and then he shouts out doing exactly what he should. And the other thing that I uh, want to illustrate from this interaction is how much of the work of typification and social inculcation goes on in a non-explicit way, just as Bourdieu's examples have it, through the, in this case, through the sequential patterning of talk. Um, and uh, I, I will um, display that by taking the same transcript and putting certain lines of it uh, in, in a vertical orientation so that you can see across lines 
you know, between uh, the mother and the child's response. You can see across the lines, the patterns of repetition and variation. Uh, don't you cry, lets you and I go to Kailagi, lets you and I get some cheese pops, don't you be a big head. So in every case, there's a tight uh, so, uh, relation between the, the, this line, don't, don't do this, instead lets, you, lets us two do this. Um, don't cry, let's go to Kailagi and get some cheese pops. So in order to understand what is entailed by this parallelism between B and C, uh, the opposition between crying and going to Kage, uh, it's important to understand that like most people in this region, Wapi and her family live not in a village, as I said, but in a little hamlet, a little kind of horticultural estate, uh, uh, yes, in a family compound surrounded by their gardens. Uh, and also that uh, Kailage, this, this uh, Meeting place, this gathering place is about 10 minutes walk away. It serves as a local market meeting place. And as I've said, it's a terminus for the only car in the area, which take, takes people back and forth to Mount Hagen. And it's a locus for uh, what are taken to be uh, very interesting and exciting prospect activities like this pool table that was, was uh, built by, by young men from the community. Um, and that trade stores in which you can buy cheese pops, for example. Um, so in this, uh, you can see, I said that the, the child doesn't just uh, repeat after his mom. Uh, she says, let's you, uh, the mom prompts him to say, let's you and I get some cheese pops. Uh, and then the, uh, the, the mother later says, don't, don't cry. Let's see. Yeah don't cry. So the mother here is prompting the child to say, don't cry. But instead, the child doesn't simply repeat that. He, he varies on it, saying, don't be a big head. In other words, you know, speaking in the same voice of kuwaru parental authority, but uh, with, a, with a variation on what the child is asked to do. So um, in some, over the course of this interaction, there emerge a number of typifications of the, the uh, interacting people's behavior and aspects of their life world, some of which are lexically explicit, they are a matter you know, of explicit wordings, and some of which are implicit in its patterns of uh, coherence and parallelism across lines that I was showing you, and the kinds of construals that they invite. And I won't go into detail about how this works, but uh, the, these, these kinds of um, oppositions or di dichotomies, axes of differentiation are are evident. Uh, present state of play versus the proposal for what to do instead, crying, not crying, the home compound, Kailage market, big head behavior of one person versus eating cheese pops together, uh, and then one which doesn't come up lexically explicit but underlies a lot of this is the notion of local indigenous ways like the ones associated with the family compound and Kewa Uk foreign exogenous ways like the ones associated with the this playground and the pool house. So these typifications operate at two levels. First, within the immediate context of this speech event and its participants, they momentarily identify Alex with the present state of play and crying, and the pair of Jesse and Alex, older and younger brother, with the proposed new activity of going to Kalige and eating cheese pops. Second, at a more general level, they identify crying as big head behavior, obstreperous, you know, uh, selfish, conceited behavior, and going to Kalge and eating cheese pops as the antithesis of crying, something that makes people happy. At the first of these two levels, concepts that are aureus associated with particular words in the language, kogra, cry, big head, from Tokpis in big head, cheese pop, from English cheese pop, uh, and get and eat and so forth, Particular words like this are brought into play for describing the, the present situation and a proposed new activity. At the second level, uh, at a more abstract level, the concepts kogra, big head, seize pop, etc., are brought into a relationship with each other and with the contrast that I've discussed between the home compound and kalige. In other words, all of this is consistent with the pervasive theme amongst cool other people that I've discussed involving the contrast between 
uh, indigenous ways and exogenous ways. As with all such typifications, through its being figured or figurated, its figuration in the discourse, this one is not only evoked, this, this differentiation is not only evoked, but enacted by the participants who thereby align themselves and each other in relation to it. This is a prime example of the reproduction of aspects of a particular uh, way of life and how it is, how that way of life is articulated with and uh, reproduced in every everyday social interaction. So I'll just jump to some conclusions now. Hmm. In the second part of this talk, in order to lay out and illustrate the range of phenomena that we're uh, focusing on in this study of child language socialization, I looked at a brief stretch of interaction involving a 21-month-old girl, uh, and I looked at, at it from four different viewpoints regarding language acquisition, the development of Let's see if I've got this slide for this. Yeah, these four. Um, so in the next part of the presentation, I looked at it. Uh, at a, I looked at a more complex interaction involving a somewhat older child, just over two years old, Jess, young Jesse, mainly from these latter two perspectives: shaping of subjectivity and the reproduction and transformation of particular ways of life. Francesca's and my work along these lines is. Uh, is being carried out in dialogue with a large body of current work within anthropology that focuses on the embodied nature of culture and the way in which it is lived through concrete practices. Linguistic anthropologists such as Bill Hanks, Greg Urban, Charles and Marjorie Goodwin, and Asif Aga have contributed to that work by, among other things, focusing closely on communicated practices and how particular speech events are grounded in more inclusive frameworks at a number of different levels, ranging from the relatively local ones that are built up over the course of a single stretch of interaction to other more long-term ones involving institutions, states, socioeconomic stratification, gender, and so forth. As a, 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 a small example of the way that linguistic anthropologists have tried to bridge uh, those levels. Uh, I direct you to the, uh, my analysis of the interaction between Wapi and Jesse. From the organization of talk and bodily interaction within approximately 15 seconds of interaction, a number of key value orientations and typifications which have a wider currency within the Western Highlands of Papua New Guinea were established and identified in differential ways with the participants in the interaction. So they're not only identified, but identified with the participants, Jesse, in particular Jesse and his brother. At, uh, at the most immediate level of ongoing interaction, these uh, forms of identification involve, for example, uh, shifting ones between Jesse and Alex, the younger and older brother, and the identification of Alex first with big head behavior, and then with the realm of efficacious foreign things. At a much more inclusive level, the shifting alignments entail the space of desire in which the exemplar of that realm, that uh, foreign efficacious realm, was cheese pops, a packaged snack food which is produced by an Australian-based multinational corporation with an annual turnover of more than $3 billion. When the interaction is looked at across the range of those levels, one can see that what is going on is equally a matter of subjectification, that is of constituting individual persons with particular ways of thinking and feeling and of engaging with, on the other hand, engaging with the global economic order within which cheese pops are produced and marketed. It thereby also contributed in an incremental way to a transformation whereby the traditional subsistence economy based on local food production in this area is becoming more of a cash economy based on the production and purchase of commodities. In, our, in order to understand the interplay of the global, the personal, and the interpersonal that's going on here, there's everything to be gained by focusing closely on everyday interaction from all four of the viewpoints that I've exemplified here, and in particular on interactions involving children, which play, play an especially important part in processes of social reproduction and transformation. End of story. Mm.